You better be listening to Sleezoids or I must break you. Toute la vie peut être infectée. Et bien. Que? Non, rien. Au revoir. Au revoir. Dites donc, au fond, le corbeau, c'est peut-être vous Qui Je suis au courrier de midi de notre anonyme. Vous n'êtes rien. Que le corbeau m'a fourni de singulières précisions sur votre manière d'administrer. Répétez ce que vous venez de dire. You know, I wish we weren't going. Why is it that the trip is always so exciting until the night before you go and then then you get almost sick with wanting to stay? <laughs> <laughs> It's the warmth you're leaving behind, Martin, the friends. You never really believe you'll find anything like them anywhere else. I feel the sickness too, and I'm not going. Well, I wish you were. Now, Martin, didn't we agree that I would stay and run the gallery and you would do the buying and yeah, journey? Yeah, huh? yeah, yeah. <laughs> a bit more wine, you think, huh? A bit more than a bit. <laughs> well, you won't find better wine than this in Germany, Martin. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Sleezoids, the podcast where we go down the rabbit hole of 20th century genre fare from the most influential canon classics to the trashiest exploitation films we can get our hands on and invite you to take along in helping us create a canon of sleaze. Each week is a double feature grindhouse style where we discuss two films loosely related by subject, genre, actor, filmmaker, or franchise. And at the end of each episode, along with our honorary Sleezoids, which you can become by subscribing on Patreon. With the help of Nicolas Cage, we will get to the bottom of the corrupt boxing industry. So join that sleaze. We decide <laughs> on all the official ratings and rankings for every film that we cover. Patreon subscribers also get an honor shout out and two bonus episodes every single month, which we have been doing for coming up on five years. There is like 120 plus bonus episodes as well as like Dang. 40 or 50 bonus transmissions where we talk about new release genre films. <clears throat> so if you haven't made the jump yet, patreon.com slash Suzoids podcast, we would recommend that. And speaking of which, we had a lot of people make the jump this week. We're going to give them their shout outs here. We had Catherine Vino, John R. Rogers, uh, moderately cold. We are too, man. It's a look at, we got snow today. <laughs> uh, uh, Casey Campbell, uh, Michael Geske, uh, Dart Spieg, uh, Ben Cosgrove, uh, Samuel Harrington, Simon Law, Nate Meisner, uh, Jeff Coots, who signed up at $10 a month and is actually going to be joining us for the monthly virtual screening, which at the time of you guys listening to this, we are going to be doing next week, the last Thursday of uh, each month, typically we do a live virtual screening for people to join and we will be doing something noir related. I, I don't remember exactly which one I have selected. I was choosing between two or three, but we've got some good ones and the noir uh, virtual screenings are always fun. Oh yeah. Um, and we also had Zach Holmgren sign up, uh, ye ol <laughs> ye urinal cake. Um, <laughs> Welcome aboard. Theodore Hanush, uh, Ethan Johnson, Benjamin C. Lucas, uh, Navina Saneve, Rylan Klo, Tony Gleed, Chase Ward, Marios Christovides, uh, Kendall Beck, Ethan Sturgill, and Aiden Andrew Chow. So thanks so much to all of you folks. Hope you are enjoying uh, those ben bonus episodes, and thanks for signing up. We appreciate the support. Um, that's the one plug as always. The, uh, the other plug is Apple podcasts and Spotify. If you are listening on either one of those platforms and I see the stats, I see you right now listening on both of those platforms, scroll down to the very bottom and give us a good old rating and review. If you haven't, it helps us climb the ranks and find new listeners. And the last plug, as always, is merch. If you like the poster art that based out of Toronto horror artist Trevor Henderson did for the podcast, you can get that basically put on anything that you can think of. A hoodie, a pen, a notebook, a pillow. You guys have bought a lot of stuff with the Sleezoids logo on it. If that interests you at all, that is in the link in the description or at sleezoidspodcast.com. But that is it for the intro. Welcome back to another week. As always, I am your host, Josh Lewis. And joining me also, as always, is my co-host, Jamie Miller. Welcome back, everybody. Welcome. We are in the thick of noir mm -hmm. We uh, we are we are smoking. We are behind the Venetian blinds. Uh, we are All we are in, in the zone. Women we shouldn't be. Yes, uh, <laughs> doing insurance scams, uh, a little <laughs> bit better than some of the protagonists in some of the films we've been talking about. Two weeks ago would have been the last time you folks would have heard from us, and we would have been kicking off Noir Vember with a uh, special friend of the pod from the We Hate Movie show, Chris Cabin. 
Uh, he came on once again, and he brought with him a Robert Seod Mac double feature where we talked about one uh, Christmas holiday, uh, which was uh, not a Christmas film. It takes place <laughs> over the course of a Christmas holiday. Definitely uh, doesn't and bring you that holiday spirit, that's for sure. <laughs> Yeah, despite the fact that it stars Deanna Durbin and Gene Kelly, musical stars, you would think that's a feel-good movie. It's not. Gene Kelly is playing a cold-blooded killer. And uh, I do think that uh, we were a little bit turned off by the framing device of the movie being told as one long flashback. But other than that, a very cool uh, film uh, yeah. of care of the, those two actors playing off-type and definitely a bleak like breakup noir. And we paired that with his film Cry of the City, which came out four years later in 1948. It has more of a uh, sort of on the ground, tense uh, set piece kind of uh, uh, vibe to it with uh, Victor Mature hunting down. It almost has like a cops and robbers, uh, childhood friends, uh, crime, <laughs> moral panic quality to it as well. But uh, really, really well directed by Siad Mark. And it was definitely fun breaking those down with Chris. So if you haven't heard that episode, that was over on the main feed two weeks ago. Go back and uh, check it out. Uh, but last week was episode number 250, uh, a really big milestone. We have officially talked about more than 500 movies on the official main feed episodes because uh, <laughs> it would be way more than that if we started to try and include bonus transmission titles. But yeah. uh, we have talked about a lot of movies on this show and we had to celebrate that monumental number with uh, two of the, uh, you know, all time best, most brutally sad and self reflexive noirs about screenwriters witnessing Hollywood in decay. We talked about Sunset Boulevard from 1950 and In a Lonely Place, also from 1950. Billy Wilder, Nicholas Ray, two uh, very different modes of depression, but depression <laughs> nonetheless. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, we we had our minds kind of uh, melted in in the normal ways that you would expect when you're talking about Sunset Boulevard and Gloria Swanson's performance and all the sort of meta qualities going on there. But then also the relationship between Nicholas Ray and Gloria Graham and Humphrey Bogart and just that triangle of uh, really intense self reflection that you can see happening on screen. Um, yeah, they're devastating movies. They really are. And yes yeah. <laughs> so, so, yeah. so if you haven't heard that episode over on the patreon last week go check it out it was a big one big uh, big old episode uh but moving on to this week we have a very special returning guest coming back he uh he's been a longtime supporter of the show one of the very first patrons and one of the people on letterbox that i go to every week to be like what piece of shit has this man watched this week <laughs> and it and is it is it great or is it not great? You know, sometimes they're great. And, uh, you know, I, I, I take uh, I take his recommendations uh, more than probably anyone else's that I follow on the website. So we we had yeah. to have him on once again. That uh -huh. is Steve well, thank, Carlton. Steve, thank how you, you doing? Thank you. I'm, I'm doing OK. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, yeah, I, 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 I'm all, always looking for uh, new, new boundaries to, uh, to, to push. So. <laughs> A new yeah, I mean, I, you were you to watch. I know I, it was it was beautiful because I was going through the Amityville films all through October. I got pretty far into the direct to video <laughs> era all the way to like 2018 ish. And uh, it was it was like having someone, you know, in the snow when someone's walked there first and they've already got the footprints there and you can kind of, you know, it's a little bit it's a little bit easier for you. To, yeah. to make your way yeah. that was what it was like when i was like steve was the only other person who logged every single one of these movies <laughs> that i was watching for like a month um and uh it, it was a pretty brutal experience but uh oh, I, yeah I, as I, I can't wait to get to amityville karen oh my god <laughs> yeah has that that came out this year right is that out yep yep <laughs> okay i'm excited <laughs> yeah I'm definitely going to get around to that too. Amityville in space too. You know, I got to see oh, what's yeah. going on oh, there. Oh man, the I'm, blade that, is that, so sharp. That, that, that's a Polonia film. I can't not. <laughs> but uh, yeah, as it goes, Steve, we have the guests to bring the double features with them. Um, so what have you brought with you this week and why did you pair these two together? Well, um, I brought um, a Le Corbeau, which is, I believe, what, 1943? Yes. Um, from uh, Henri-Georges Clouseau. And Address Unknown, which is 1944 from William Cameron Menzies. 
And the connecting thread is basically angry letters in the shadow of Nazism. Yeah. Do you want that's that's that do you know what? For some reason I was sitting there going, you know, these are like <laughs> wartime noirs. For some reason, and man, my brain, I don't know where it's at right now. I didn't even connect the letter thing, but that's so true. <laughs> The whole thing is he's sending poison pen letters in the other one, and then the other ones, they're writing back and forth to each other with letters. So you yep. are absolutely spot on. These are two noirs where characters are sending letters back and forth to one another, and they both have a very, um, you know, the they both are definitely infected by uh, Nazism and the uh, the uh, World War II experiences that were going uh, on at the time, especially in, in uh, Le Corbeau, we'll say. Because, I mean, it's very literal yeah. in the in the text of Address Unknown, but Le Corbeau, which isn't even dealing with it in the narrative, uh, you can just feel it all over that film, that yeah. that was made in a Nazi-occupied France. It's just uh, very dark, um, very paranoid stuff. Yeah, I mean, they, they, there there is a reason it was, you know, banned for so long at, uh, you know, at post-war, so. Yes, <laughs> and we will we will get into that because it has had a crazy life story getting out there. Um, but uh, yeah, so we're going to be talking about some 1940s uh, Nazi occupation noirs, characters setting letters. We're going to have a great time. So let's jump into it here. Let's start off with Le Corbeau. You said tout à l'heure que vous demandiez à la ville apaisement. Ah oui, l'oubli total. Je ne peux pas vous offrir tant que ça. Et quelques heures d'oubli, ça compte tout de même. Taisez-vous. Enfin, oui ou non, connaissez-vous la personnalité du corbeau All right, we are talking Le Corbeau, the 1943 fen- French noir directed by uh, Henri Georges Clouseau and co written by him and one uh, Louis Chavin or Louis Chavance. Uh, we're, we're trying to experiment our, our French a little bit here. We did have to take <laughs> French in school, so our, our accents can usually be pretty good, but even our pronunciations can be a little wrong. I haven't had to take it since elementary school. So. I, I, yeah, I, I grew up in California, so I took Spanish. I didn't take French, so <laughs> I'm, I'm just kind of freestyling it. Let's go. That's that's what we want to hear. Uh, but this is actually our first time talking about Henry Georges Clouseau, uh, mm. believe it or not, actually. So uh, very, wow. very well-known French director behind films such as The Wages of Fear, uh, which we will actually probably be covering sometime next year. We've had someone holding it in reserve for like three years. We just haven't done the episode yet. Um, is that the we've already done Sorcerer. That was, um, for yes. Sorcerer? <laughs> Yes. Gotcha. So we've done Sorcerer, but we haven't done that one yet. So we will do The Wages of Fear. Um, <laughs> and uh, he's also did uh, Diabolique and La Verite. Um, uh, but he is probably most well-known state uh, stateside for Wages of Fear, mostly, uh, you know, of, because of the William Friedkin Sorcerer connection about making a film. Also about men trying to transport dangerous amounts of uh, nitroglycerin through the South <laughs> American jungle. Um <laughs> You guys know the uh, the Diabolique Psycho story, right? No. Shoot. Oh, but um, there was a um, uh, Hitchcock once got a, a letter from a concerned parent uh, where they said that their their child had seen Diabolique and became scared to take a bath, and then they saw Psycho and became scared to take a shower. <laughs> so, what advice do, do, does he have? And Hitchcock responded with, "Send her to the dry cleaners." <laughs> <laughs> That is that uh, Hitchcock sparkling personality right there <laughs> coming through, uh, which awesome. is which is funny too because I was reading a little bit about Henry George Clouseau and apparently this guy he's a little bit of a controlling guy. Too. People didn't really like working with this guy from what I can tell. Even even people who liked him, actresses who worked with him, called him a short-tempered pessimist and a generally <laughs> negative being who was forever at odds with himself and the world around him. <laughs> <laughs> yep, he's a he, he's he's a legendary director, an absolute genius, and like a lot of geniuses, he was a real dickhead. <laughs> <laughs> he was he he seemed anyway, based on the subject matter of so many of his films, pretty drawn to pretty dark, corrupt subject matter, and you know had a little bit of a bleak sensibility to him, which you know might stem a little bit from 
his uh, upbringing in as, as a young boy in 1920s um, uh, France and eventually becoming a screenwriter in the 1930s where he was apparently, as you can tell by this film and what we'll be talking about in it, he was pretty obsessed with the German expressionists, particularly uh, F, uh, filmmakers like F.W. Murnau, who we've talked about, and Fritz Lang, uh, which is obvious because you can, I mean, uh, probably for both of these films, we'll say you can feel M all over oh, yeah. these. Mm. Uh, yeah, definitely. The, the mob hysteria, the the the, the use of signage, um, even just the, the shots of the kids playing and stuff like that. Um, Silhouettes and it, the way he uses shadows and stuff. Yeah, and and just the, the 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 dark secrets that surround these, like you know, otherwise very what you should expect to be sort of normal provincial um, places, which does ring true to a little bit of other films too, like Shadow of a Doubt or even something like The Naked Kiss that we've talked about. Um, but apparently, Clouseau. Uh, had a pretty crazy life that included being bedridden for five years in a sanatorium due to tuberculosis, Damn. Yeah. which is pr- <laughs> pretty nuts, which is actually how he avoided being drafted into world war two because he had, he had health issues. They didn't, and they, they didn't take him. And, but also because they couldn't take him, he was unable to escape France when the Germans eventually occupied them uh, and started making films for their own German production companies, including continental films which is where he would make this film Le Corbeau and actually subsequently that is what would create so much hysteria surrounding the film which would get the film banned in a post-liberated France because technically he was charged with collaborating with Nazis and banned from from filmmaking for life because he took Nazi money to make this film and to shoot it um which eventually other filmmakers did get that reduced down to a two year sentence for uh, no longer being allowed to make films. <laughs> um, and uh, but for anyone who hasn't seen it, the film is loosely based on this uh, sort of anonymous letter case in France from 1917. Uh, and it uh, it is uh, about a, a doctor named Remy Germain, played by Pierre Fresnay, uh, who is awesome in uh, Renoir's Grand Illusion, which is actually the last time I think that I've seen him in a film. Um, But he's a doctor in a small uh, French town who becomes the focus of essentially a a pretty vicious, libelous (laughs) campaign uh, against his character and with a series of poison pen letters accusing him of uh, having affairs with all kinds of women in town and performing unlawful abortions. And all of these letters keep getting sort of anonymously mailed to village leaders. Um, and the mysterious writer behind them calls signs each letter as Le Corbeau or the Raven. And I do like that he signs it with like a literal like picture of just a, a tiny yes. raven. It's kind of cute. <laughs> yeah. uh, I love the little raven. <laughs> Yeah, and he soon starts targeting not just Remy Germain, but the entire town and starts exposing everyone's dark secrets and uh, everyone starts kind of losing their minds and community breaks down and things get a little get a little un- unpleasant from there. Uh, but Steve, for for you, when when did you first watch watch this film? What was what was first impressions? Um, I believe I know I, I looked this up the other day. I believe my first viewing of this was back in 2004. It was shortly after um, Criterion had done their DVD of it, which unfortunately is now out of print because of the Studio Canal deal that they had that that expired. But I was kind of on a did, did they recently about, upgrade that to Blu-ray, or am I wrong about that? I don't think so, but I could be wrong. Mm. I, I I feel like if someone's gonna if anyone's gonna do a blue of it at this point, it's probably not gonna be Criterion. It might be Kino Lorber because I think that's who has the it Studio Canal stuff now. It actually is a new release, Blu-ray. Oh yeah, this Excellent. year I guess. Yeah, this Excellent. year. Excellent. I'll have to, uh, Very I'll have to fresh. <laughs> yeah, I, I was on a kind of a Clouseau kick at that point anyway. Like you know, I'd seen Diabolique a couple of times. I'd seen Wages of Fear a couple of times. I was just like, what else? What else has this guy done? And you know that you know, when when they put that out, I'm like, oh, I gotta check this out. And I was just knocked out by it. It's. I mean, it, it get you know, especially knowing the circumstances under which it was made, it was like. It, yeah. Okay. So then, you know, he took money from the Nazis and made this anti-collaboration, anti-collabor, collaboration fable, basically. Yeah. I think I, I think you're spot on. Like, like I think people registered immediately that it, it does have a bit of a kind of bitterly grim 
kind of tone to it. But I think at the time, because of the circumstances in which it was made, people were obviously, you know, they were like, well, the Nazis paid for it. So obviously this guy is, you know, saying that the French people are a bunch of uh, corrupt idiots and (laughs) terrible people. And (laughs) this whole movie is just about shockingly shining a light on their own hypocritical behavior. And as a result, (laughs) it was very controversial when it came out. Like it, uh, it was, you know, immediately in France after the liberation, the story was taken as this is designed to vilify us and our, our people. And it was suppressed until essentially 1969, I believe, uh, when they finally were like, okay, this can, this can come back out. But even, and, and he was luckily able to start making films again as, as early, I think as night, it was like 1949 or something like that. So he, he eventually, you know, did kind of win out. And I think with distance, people did kind of begin to realize that the film was, you know, it was definitely largely more anti-informant, like the idea of anonymous letters as like a bad thing, which to be coming out at that time, like Nazis liked receiving um, (laughs) uh, letters of people ratting on each other and exposing each other. Like that was one of their primary methods of, you know, uh, generating fear in the community. So this, you can say 100% this movie is against that, um, yeah, it felt more like it was like the paranoia that would come with the occupation would also make the the French citizens kind of go at each other's throats as well. That's that's how I yeah. was reading it. And definitely, well, and, definitely. I mean, it, at, you know, near the end of the film, you have the mailman uh, essentially exclaiming that by delivering the mail, that makes him an accessory. Yes, <laughs> right. It's you know, it, it, he's he's definitely not being subtle or, or careful about this. It, yes. It's you know. It, it's meant to indict the people it means to indict. Yeah. Yeah. And it, so it, it, it's definitely, you know, a depiction of this sort of poisonous effect of becoming fearful and insular and trading in community, um, you know, uh, when when you should be trying to, you know, sort of generate it. And this idea of also, I think, being watched by a force that can basically reach out and destroy you and all of your connections to friends and family at any moment. But, you know, there's nothing that you can really do about it. You don't really know what it is. It's just out you, there. You, ba- you basically have just to, to wait for your turn on the wheel because, you know, yeah. it's coming. Yeah. yeah. And I like the idea, yeah. too, that it sets up like a a small town anywhere. Um, yes. Like anywhere in the world. Yeah, so it just feels like this kind of paranoia can corrupt really any group of people or a community. Yeah. So the, 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 was the, I think the, the title card reads a small town here or elsewhere. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. <laughs> or it's like, yeah, the, the metaphorical intent is made very clear right off the bat. Yeah. Yeah. And I like that we're introduced uh, to like the the creaking gates of the church and Dr. Remy Germain, he's r- r- leaving a farmhouse to wash the blood on his wrists, having failed to deliver a baby for a woman. His third abortion, supposedly in, in, a, in a month, which is starting <laughs> to make the other doctors suspicious because they're like, well, you're saving the mother's great. But every single time this baby is dying, like, what are you doing? You know, it's not what you're saying. Yeah. And uh I, I and I also like the depiction of this town as like very very small and you know sort of connected geographically um, through you know like you just get moments like the ringing bells as we move through like the school wrapping up and then you can also see uh, cut to like the hospital where you have the patients and the patients are also hearing those same bells going off that the kids were just running away to and now we're in like a gothic looking hospital being visited by nurses where there is this unlucky patient number 13 named Francois oh, who yeah. is dying of liver cancer and can't sleep despite the uh, the doc Remy prescribing him morphine so he starts to assume that the staff are stealing his morphine and there's all kinds of little small little dramas that kind of crop up that you know it are, are just Little details that are ripe for the Raven to sort of, well, of pick course, up on. Of course, it turns out his assum- his assumptions aren't wrong. That no, someone someone on the staff is stealing morphine to give to someone else. Yes, and and I, I really like the reveal when it does eventually crop up on who it is who's getting the the, the morphine from him. Like, and there's I I really like the just the way that this sort of builds out its detail of of character. 
and a lot of the ways that these you know people interact with and and the the web of interaction that these characters have like the way that he's constantly like making house calls to denise who he thinks is like faking illnesses to try to flirt with him or the way he has Mm -hmm. to like run through a crowd of children who he clearly is not crazy about dealing with children which we find out has to do partially with his own backstory and he has a romantic interest in this woman named laura who is a married woman and the sister of one of uh, the nurses uh, who, you know, basically tells them that they are being in, indecent uh, by like openly writing letters to one another and mm-hmm. uh, visiting him at work and like all of this. And that's actually the very first thing that the anonymous letter from the Raven uh, basically points out. And he says like, stop messing around with Laura. Like I see everything that, that you are uh, doing. And so now they are officially obliged to stop because they were what looked like having kind of like an open affair. There's actually an awesome shot of, him too um when he's reading the first note from the raven and it's a pov shot like through the keyhole while the little girl is spying on him which also yeah yeah (laughs) yeah, which which by the way i was you know like the also in um oh shit what's the uh branded to kill branded to kill i was like (laughs) i was like keyhole shot there it is baby (laughs) so good the fun, I, I, I've got a bit of a, a left field connection here too. I'm not sure it makes sense, but uh, it's it, it, right right at the beginning of the film, like with with that uh, when when the camera kind of pushes in through that creaking gate, and yes. like then then looks up towards the um, the, the 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 bell tower mm-hmm. as it's chiming it. Uh, just the 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 it, following the uh, the small town here or elsewhere title card, kind of setting up setting up as an obvious parable. It. Um, kind of gave it a, a, a like a this could be any town you know that the sort of mm-hmm. sort of feel sort of you know kind of and the artificiality of it kind of jumped out at me and it made me think about i don't i don't know if you guys have seen uh rossellini's the machine that kills bad people no, no. but oh oh what that, a great title though yeah great yeah title. Oh, it's, it, it's it's a terrific title that that one came out um i think about a decade later and it's it, it has a similar sort of you know in anywhere um, you know in the world sort of feel mm-hmm. uh and it's it's it it, it kind of starts in that same sort of like this is deliberately artificial kind of pull in uh and it's i mean that that's a beautiful film if you've never seen it it's a uh very very puckish for a rossellini uh which well, is watch cool. is that for sure it very, it, yeah it's a, it's a, it's a very interesting watch and in, in, in as much as it's it's i think it's about as funny as rossellini ever allowed himself to be really <laughs> uh, but it's yeah, it's about this photographer who um, uh, finds out his uh, his camera can like freeze people and, uh, and like and you know kill them basically, like take their souls away. And yeah. it, it develops into this whole this whole metaphor about um, uh, whether or not you know, but about like playing God and things like that. And it, it's, oh, it's it's terrific, but. It, it's it was just interesting to to see that kind of that you know that 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 kind of artifice kind of made it together you know yeah no the like the the way that this looks like the like cause some of I have to imagine some of it is location work because some of the out exterior stuff looks just too uh, good I, oh, I yeah, I'd have like to outside assume on the some doctor's level. offices and stuff like. He has full yeah, full courtyards in the shots. So, but there's definitely some big sets and stuff happening uh, here too, and like the massive, like lavish interiors of the of the churches, and like the the really choice use of directional lighting in the form of like single light bulbs in the room. Or there's some very mm-hmm. like canted horror angles and precise moments of confusion and in in fear as unexpected secrets of the town are are revealed, and people start kind of like turning on uh, one another. Like one particular sequence we'll get to i thought the funeral procession sequence and the way that it's the whole the way that the whole thing shot i was like oh, yeah. <laughs> flabbergasted um by by that um but there's uh, there's also a scene in here that i wanted to get to that i that i i, I really love because i also find just some of the the writing and and the dialogue to be very witty and very fun mm. and i really mm. like the character who basically uh goes like will graham mode on the uh raven's note uh to him because he's like you know you should you should give me the raven's note about uh you know trying to expose your affair with laura 
uh, because interpretation and mystification go hand in hand. <laughs> and he starts pointing out that, you know, like the odd handwriting. And he's like, you know, there's lots of intelligence in this writing and sensuality and a lack of flexibility. He's uh, probably a very handsome block without any friends. And uh, he's a, a mental case. And, you know, good luck finding him because he could be the public prosecutor over there or he could be Mr. Fayol over here withdrawing money or he could be you. <laughs> yourself and you know mad men sometimes accuse themselves and you know just there's there's a lot of uh very you know he basically sets it up for you right away that there's no way to know exactly who this person is other than you know they have very very targeted feelings about you and and your behavior and you know as the letters start funneling in they become more clearly intentionally designed not just to disrupt his life but to cause a general you know, sense of chaos, like telling some staff members and, you know, insulting them, like calling them drug drunkards or like swine drug dealers and cuckolds. And there's even one where he sends one to, I think it's the, it's the, uh, surgeon where he's saying that your daughter is, uh, sleeping or no i think he's to, it's to the other guy he says your daughter is sleeping with the surgeon and she should perhaps go see dr Ma- germain because <laughs> he's so bad at delivering babies that he'll abort it for you <laughs> <laughs> like God just damn. dark stuff <laughs> <laughs> jesus christ yeah it's uh well, I mean, there's also the um, the one letter that shows up that implies that Doctor Germain, the surgeon, uh, has had dalliances with the uh, the 15 year old girl who's running through the film. Yep, which is that's quite an accusation. Yeah, yeah. no, like the, the 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 air of hostility around you know that starts generating as people start you know they, they read these and some of them go well that's just outrageous and the, the ones about me by the way are not true and all the ones about <laughs> other people though i'm gonna believe all those ones <laughs> yeah and start attacking like your own community there's there's a ton of moments where the the people are defending themselves and then uh they're just like well i read this about you so this is exactly how i think or i like also when like certain aspects of the clean surface that's kind of at the beginning when they're giving all the shots of the town and people just interacting gets uh corrupted a little bit like uh the the little girl um that plays with the ball and uh it's it's shown that like every week she gets a loan from some other adult for a couple hundred dollars yep. and that's kind of like her <laughs> little uh hustle <laughs> yeah yep. and she's still like the entire time she's on screen she's played very very innocently and just kind of like oh i messed up at my job and i just need to you know, put the money back in what I borrowed and all of that. So, yeah, I like how these things slowly dish out and kind of just corrupt. Or it's it's less that it corrupts the the town and more the corruption that's already within it is just being exposed, I guess. Yeah. And he starts striking up a relationship with a second woman, which is not a great idea um, yeah. <laughs> in with with the current accusations being leveled at him of uh, having affairs and, you know, doing these unlawful abortions that he's doing and everything. And, yeah, there is there is this interesting character in the character of uh, Denise, played by uh, Jeanette Leclerc, who you, they kind of start you off by kind of like assuming that she is um you know, just kind of a, a, a weird like sex pot or something mm. like that. Who's just like really interested in in him. And that's like her j- just her thing. But they, they start layering out some interesting detail where, you know, like she has some crippling hip issues from an accident when she was a kid. And, you know, her uh, they 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 start to think that, you know, he, she's jealous of his, you know, affair that he might be striking up with Laura. So she might be writing the letters. And then they start assuming that maybe two people are writing the letters. And while she has a brother and a brother would have the time to sit around and write all those letters. And they, there's, there's a lot of uh, sort of assumptions that characters start making about people. And it is interesting how many of them kind of prove to be disastrously false um, mm-hmm. to the point where some characters start, you know, like killing themselves, like like patient number 13. He goes. He goes mad, and he cuts his own throat with a straight razor after a note that basically told him, kind of like the truth about his condition, um, yep. and w- which also makes it more suspicious that it was uh, Laura's sister Marie who was uh, supposedly stealing his morphine and mistreating him. So everyone goes, "Well, we think it's Marie now," and which leads into that giant, spectacular-looking funeral sequence where, like, literally, it turns from them all gathering together to obviously mourn this man who died and there's these 
this amazing like horse carriage just stuffed with hundreds of flowers and the camera is like placed inside of it and yeah. there's also this amazing like low angle uh shot as uh, everyone notices that there's a letter on the ground and everyone is literally oh. like stepping out of the way to not have to pick it up yeah they're like, like i just, don't need to know what's inside that thank you very much yeah not my <laughs> business and then of course some like curious little kids are the ones that end up picking it up and uh and then Jermaine just has to find out, has to know. Yeah. But that well, I mean, is that the I, one also I, I where it propels also, uh, the um that kind of chase sequence that yes. is almost just built through empty alleyways, which is cool too. You don't really see people chase her, but it's just that like that endless paranoia that's been building up that's making her run away. Um Yeah, it's so sick. Yeah. And eventually well, I guess they do get her and arrest her to find out if the letters continue or not. Um but it, it is it, interesting like to the, constantly watch them just accuse the next person and every single time they do they're just absolutely convinced that they're right this time <laughs> well in the, the pursuit the pursuit of Mar- maria is the like the the most explicitly noirish mm-hmm. in terms of how it's shot sure. just with you know as she run as she runs through the, through the various alleys it's you know all shot in these these heavy canted angles and there's these huge shadows as she's running and mm. you know, it, it's it's very much like like the the you know, the paranoia kind of overwhelms the uh, the form at that point, and and the the film kind of evolves to match it, and it's you know, yep, yeah, well, and, and the amazing use of like you know her obviously being sort of imposed on by this sort of looming architecture and breaking into her. Uh, her own place where she finds out that you know her house has been completely raided and destroyed and she's like staring into like a broken mirror that's like shattering our you know the image of her face into like a couple different sort of jagged pieces that we're seeing like it's it's very very expressionistically done and and they they do capture her they bring her in and they're like okay well clearly it was marie because marie wanted to kill this guy and he's killed himself so you know it got the result that she wanted um therefore that's her and then when they capture her you know, oh, well, they're like, wow, no, we haven't got any letters in a couple days. This is great. This is all, you know, this is all over. And then we, we get we did this. It. Yeah. <laughs> Congrats, everyone. Uh, the, the the mob hysteria, it, 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 it worked this time. Um, <laughs> and then you get this really beautiful wide shots of this mass. And there's this church and the light rays are shining through. And they're preaching about this idea of rejecting discord. And uh, as he's preaching about that, there's this amazing shot of the, a new letter just falling slowly down from from the second floor of of the church and onto the congregation right after As he's they thanking rejoiced. God and shit as if it's like yes. God giving them an answer. Yeah. He's like, here's another letter. Deal with that. <laughs> yes. Just fl- and, fluttering down from the rafters like a raven. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's true. And yeah, they they straight up say like the letter straight up says that, you know, the cleansing campaign has just begun of of the corruption of the city. And you have an epidemic on your hands that is spreading daily and characters as a result start becoming, you know, completely ostracized from one another. They start trying to intercept the letters at the post office at a certain point, which is a great little scene when they're all just starting to try to dig through. And they're like, hey, is that one to my wife? Give me that one. (laughs) That you don't need to send that one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know what it says, but it's it's probably not good. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, they start finding out like other secrets about each other. There's a guy cracking a joke about finding notes between uh, the uh, concierge and his wife. And he just he literally cracks a joke about just like slapping his wife upside the head about it and stuff like that. There's like <laughs> there's a little girl crying in the streets because she found a note that says that her dad isn't her biological father. Oh, like this God, raven. Yeah. Is just she's saying that she wants chaos. to die because of it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, she's going through it in that scene. My lord. <laughs> really young to have an existential crisis like that. <laughs> Yeah, and and they finally decide they've had enough. They're like, okay, well, Jermaine is clearly the main target, so let's get rid of Jermaine, and they'll stop, and that's it. And this is the very clearly the most like obviously anti-Nazi thing in the film, where they're like straight up like, well, well if we throw one guy to the wolves, it'll yeah, end it all. It'll end. It's yeah, over. we'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. And they start like spying on him and digging further into his background to try to scare him and drive him out like themselves. Like they're just starting to behave like the Raven at that point. And they do eventually find out because he's, you know, they dig so far into his background. He has to reveal it. And he's basically like, look, I'm not a gynecologist. I'm a brain surgeon from the city whose wife died during a complicated childbirth, thus basically killing 
uh, the child and killing his wife and basically making him want to move to this small province uh, and, you know, basically just make sure no mother was killed during that process again. Um, yeah. And so he's basically literally saving each and every one of their wives uh, instead of having them die in childbirth. And they are they interpreted that as you know, aborting their children in secret, which is not what he was doing, Mm -hmm. which is again, you know, just having this sort of like paranoid surface be revealed to be just something else entirely is a really intriguing thing because the movie introduces you to kind of believe that idea up front. Like we're introduced to him with just like the blood on his arms and washing it off. Um, and, and, and hearing him, you know, explain that there's like a righteous reason behind that. It's, you know, he's, you know, he's like, you, you've all, are, are you all happy now? that you've all figured this out and he calls them all like stupid for it and you know, stuff like that. And so, yeah, it's, it's, it's very obvious the messaging many, many years later, but I could see at the time, I guess, you know, I could see being tainted by the perspective of just where, the, where the film came from. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, 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 I suppose there's also a, a certain level of, a uh, uh, reluctance to, to reckon nationally with what was going on. Like I, I suspect people informing some, on one another. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't, like it's not so, a some, some of these, yeah, the, the the idea that he took Nazi money to to make the film was a convenient cover for the fact that it made the Vichy government look really bad. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like yeah, th- this is like oh yeah, this was just how life was. You 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 know dog eat dog and hope hope that y- your turn isn't next. Yeah. <laughs> I also like that but, they make um they make Jermaine not an incredibly likable character whatsoever. So yeah. as these things start to build up, you um there's certain things that you can start to consider, you know, believing about him. It doesn't justify any of these these actions obviously and it's like it, it's destroying the community, but I like that he's not this uh he's not like an incredibly well liked person it seems he still even has a little bit of back and forth with it with his colleagues he's got he, i think he even says himself he's like i don't have friends but i don't have enemies either um yeah. so he, he's just kind of built to i guess satisfy himself um and so when all these things unravel you you have, you feel bad for everybody in a sense but there, there's something about him being already kind of a uh corrupted human being with the affairs and and all of that well, he's he's deeply cold and unsympathetic. Yeah, and I mean that that's that that's what's fascinating about the way the way that the scenes with him and Denise play out. Oh, definitely. Like he, like he. Uh, I mean, especially in the the in the first couple of scenes, it's like she's trying to seduce him, and he wants nothing to do with it. He 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 finds her like like disagreeable on on a moral level, mm-hmm. and then he kind of allows himself to go along with it anyway. Right, which doesn't make him more sympathetic. No, not it, at all. It, and it, even it seems like it seems like he's condescending to her by allowing himself to be seduced. Like, yeah. fine, fine, this is what you want. Yeah, and he's and he's uh, there's moments too where he's kind of prone to a little bit of uh, violence, like when she fakes the um the the sweats or whatever with the wet cloth that she has on her neck, and then he finds oh. it, and so he just yeah. takes it and smacks her across the face with yes. it. <laughs> Like he, he's he's definitely not the uh, the the kindest person. That's for sure. Not His the bedside manner leader. could use a little a uh, l- little improvement. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, and yeah, I, well, well, and it's wrapped up and he is also kind of suspicious of her, right? Because he doesn't think that yeah. it's Marie. He thinks that it's her because he thinks that, you know, she has all of these, um, I guess what you could call sort of like grievances with the way that, you know, the, the town treats her and the way that she would like to, you know, she thinks that like, you know, I'm a pretty attractive woman and, you know, I should be able to seduce this, this doctor. Why is it like this already married woman who shouldn't be having any sort of affair? Why is she the one who gets his attention you know so she has right. this kind of like natural grievance against him specifically which right. then him being the primary target everyone starts going well denise and her brother kind of make sense for the people who might be sending these letters and he actually ends up convincing um uh laura and her husband uh one of his fellow doctors that uh, that might be the case. So they decide to occupy the school for a day with like police guards outside and everything. And they <laughs> yep. do this like big handwriting test session for all the main suspects, which apparently, by the way, 
this uh, dictation session that they do was actually something they did in the real case in the 1910s and oh, uh, cool. actually resulted in them finding out who was writing the letters. <laughs> wow. <Damn. laughs> yeah. That must have been a nerve wracking test for that guy. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and it is, it is cool. Like the way that they layer it out where they're like, you're going to do like, you're not just going to, we're not going to come, come in and you're just going to write something quickly for us. It's like, no, you're going to do hours and hours of writing because the way that they go is like, look, the person is writing so many letters that at a certain point, they would just revert after hours of writing letters to their natural hand printing style. You couldn't fake, right. you couldn't do these like strained yeah. purposefully, not your handwriting for doing it for that long. So that is what the test is, is get them writing for a few hours and keep them going. And eventually the natural style is going to come to the surface and they do it in this awesome, like day to night, like time-lapse crossfade as well, where mm-hmm. they've been writing for hours and hours. And Denise, they assume straight up faints from what appears to be exhaustion or, or guilt from, and they're like, okay, well that just doubly confirms her guilt. And then I do love that it's revealed that actually in actuality, she's pregnant with Jermaine's child, which is why (laughs) she's, you know, feeling ill from being forced to write for like 10 hours straight. (laughs) Oh my God. (laughs) And on, and, and, and I mean, that's the, uh, that, that, that's the point when the plot kind of hinges to, you know, from, from, who is the Raven to uh, there is no one answer to this. Yeah. It, it you know, but it slowly, you know, it slowly it starts coming out that multiple people have had reasons to write Raven letters and have written Raven letters. Mm. Yep. So, you know, it, 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 it kind of ex- just explodes the idea of one person being guilty and then, you know, go, then goes into just triples <laughs> amongst the community. Exactly. Go, Go, yeah. Goes into the whole idea of you know paranoia fostering more paranoia, and, yeah, you know, well, indict, indicting the whole the whole uh, uh, systems in the world of looking for. But mm-hmm. you know what I'm getting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, because for Germain, he just immediately goes, OK, well, she's 100 percent the Raven, whereas like Volzer, who is uh, Laura's husband, is like, no, 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 no. Like, I'm not. Uh, we, he gives a big speech about like people having shades of good and and evil like not just being it's not just all like a light and dark thing which is followed by this great on the nose image but a great image nonetheless of him rocking the uh the single bulb back and forth in the room like a pendulum and for like the rest of the scene the lighting uh, and the shadows on their faces just keeps changing while they continue to have this you know this harsh conversation is that yeah and he and he explains to him and where he's that he's the one who's been stealing the morphine that Marie was taking it, but she wasn't just taking it to sell it because she's a selfish person. She was taking it because her uh, brother-in-law is an actual addict and needs it. Yep. And, mm-hmm. you know, and, you know, it, it, it keeps him not in pain and able to do his job of also helping people. So he's like, I, I don't consider myself a bad person necessarily for for doing that. But like, obviously, at the beginning, you see something bad on its surface, you immediately go, that's what that is. And yeah, this is what the, this kind of line of thinking is just what the, the Raven kind of leans into and kind of promotes thinking like, which leads them all to just make terrible decisions, of course. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I, I find a, I, was it Volgeau? Yeah, so, that's right. Yeah. I, I, I find his character fascinating. If for no other reason, then he is the chillest, jolliest cuckold. Yes. <laughs> He's like, I, I know you're dallying with my wife. Whatever. I'm old. She's young. Yeah. We're basically <laughs> friends now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But uh, but then, of course, it turns out that, you know, because of the, the whole morphine thing, it's like, he, well, he has reason to kind of kind of glance off the, oh, you know, it's not a big deal. It's like, well, yeah, because he doesn't want his own secrets exposed. Right. Yeah. I do like it's an honor have. system when you think about it. You know, yeah. we all. <laughs> I don't. I don't know your shit. You don't know my shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're, we're ju- we're just gonna live life, and then then this this you know this whole situation comes along where it's like no, nobody gets to just do that anymore. So let let's let's see how how the society works now, and it doesn't work out very well for most people. <laughs> no. no, I mean, one of, no one of my favorite moments is when he eventually catches Denise red handed writing the letter from mm. the Raven, because it's one of those things where she and she is truthful when she says it. But she's just like, you know, this was my first time writing the letter. I, I just I, I couldn't tell you to your face that, you know, I'm pregnant with your child. I needed the cover of the Raven to be able to do that. But, 
you know, uh, he he immediately sees that happening and he's like, well, case solved. There she is signing a letter with the raven on it. So you're the pervert who has been poisoning us for months. And I'm to have a child with this mad woman. (laughs) I don't want a degenerate child. The raven was right. And so he's literally threatening to abort this child uh, in front of her. (laughs) Well, and and then also, I I believe it was earlier that she had thrown herself down the stairs. Right. Yeah. And and he he had come come to her, her, her rescue and... You know, you know, he didn't know at the time that she she had found out that she was pregnant and had tried to self abort there. Mm-hmm, so, yeah. Jesus, yeah, just like just really, really grim stuff. Like especially too when she goes like, you know, I just got a phone call from from Laura that she she just got a death threat letter from from the Raven, and I definitely didn't write oh, that. So you yeah. should you should go over there. And when he goes there. Uh, Laura hasn't opened the, the letter yet and didn't even know of its existence. And so then he immediately obviously goes, well, well, Denise was just lying. You know, she she clearly wrote that letter to you and it was lying. And you see so you go through like so many different twists of like, who could it possibly be? And then he discovers that Laura has fresh ink on her hands and is actually manipulating both her. And so she really did call Denise and Denise was telling the truth about that phone call, but then also wrote the letter herself and then feigned not knowing that it was there just to further implicate. Denise like it's just insane like head scratchers upon and and then it's, we realize the extent is that she probably wrote the very first letter and then it was her husband Michael Volzer who wrote the the other ones the subsequent yeah yeah, yeah. He, so and, it's like how many I love people the, I love write the reveal the letters blotter where uh, I love the re- reveal the blotter where he looks at it and she's clearly been practicing the raven uh, uh yes <laughs> Not just the print, but the like the the little raven that gets drawn at the bottom of the of, of yes. the, the, the letters. Yeah, it's I, th- that that made me chuckle. It also gets pretty dark when you start to consider just his like th- this entire time he's portrayed as a very charismatic and kind of um, like a person that seems to be able to talk to anybody within the community and at least be friendly with them. Um, and then he uses that position to convince. Uh, the people to take away his his wife Laura to the to the asylum or whatever it is. Oh, yeah. Um, and you get that shot of her just like screaming as they take her into the van, and she just goes off uh, up the hill, and it's like the last time that Jermaine sees her. Um, well, and, and what does it say that the most like socially charming and warm character in yeah. probably the entire film was the one who was actually the one writing the letters the entire time? Yeah, yeah. Like, more so than anyone. Like Laura and Denise, you can argue each maybe wrote a letter yeah. um, and had, you know, sort of like flawed reasoning behind doing so, but aren't like completely terrible people. Yeah, and it was like strategic the guy where they like in the positions that they were in. Yeah. Whereas like this guy was very, very calmly trying to generate disastrous effects for the entire community. And and uh, and yeah, he seemed pretty chill about being a cuckold. So like, was it revenge? <laughs> I'm not certain. We don't know, <laughs> because unfortunately, the uh, patient number 13's mother, who we oh see my great God. Shower with the veil at the funeral uh, with like the big cross behind her and everything. Yeah. She comes in like a vengeful spirit right at the end of the movie and slices his throat uh, on top of the letter, the last letter that he's writing. So we actually never hear any sort of explanation from him, which I actually do. Think after after really previously telling touch. Jermaine, this 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 razor has been used only once before. It will be used again. Yes. What a yeah. line. <laughs> yeah. And I like that you said, uh, like, a kind of like a spirit kind of wandering around because she doesn't take off the funeral veil or anything like that. So she just has the, the black dress as she's going about and exacting her vengeance. Um, so I thought that that was really cool. Also, there's a cool foreshadowing uh, shot with um, when uh, Germaine and uh, Vorzette are talking and Vorset's going down the stairs and then his shadow gets bigger and bigger and bigger as he grows more distance down the set of stairs. Yeah. Um, and I just really <laughs> loved that shot. And, you know, looking back, it's a, it's pretty, I guess on the nose in a sense of it's kind of very ominous, but uh, I, I really think it's, it's great technique and, and just kind of this, like, you know, it's, it is, it's, it's um, just kind of a dark shadow across the, the town that this is, it, it's created. So, yeah. Um, very cool shot. 
Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I uh, just you know getting into the 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 idea of what happens to Vosgier at the end there. Uh, I did also like the fact that the the last shot of the film is um, uh, the widow the 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 mother the grieving mother uh, walking away mm-hmm. still in her in her, uh, her 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 veil and you know her black clothing but the way that it's shot it's like the the fabric is swaying from side to side and it starts to look like wings. So it's like, yeah, the Raven could have been anybody. The, well, yeah, the, and 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 it yeah. pans up to her from like the kids playing too, where like yeah. they didn't see any of that just happen, presumably. Yeah, there's like a, there is a very like this could happen, uh, like the beginning, anywhere, yeah. anyone. It's all, uh, it's all possible. Yeah, uh, it's, yeah, it's, no, it's, it's 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 not a person; it's a feeling. Yeah, which is also why I really like that we don't get like a big altercation with like a big speechifying Volzer or something. Like he just yeah. dies. Like that's it, you know. And like he just gets murdered, and we never find out exactly what his overall intent was. Like if it was because he was angry at Laura and um, Jermaine and just wanted to get her locked up and him accused, or like you know we don't like we can assume that I guess maybe, but we don't know that for sure. And I I really like that detail of it. Yeah, and him just, you know, dead over his last letter that I assume he was feeling, you know, he got away with something pretty major here. Uh, and <laughs> yeah. the, the image itself of, like, it, it seems as if within the movie, I'm sure from 1943, they're not just going to have a big, like, slit throat, uh, bloody <laughs> scene or anything like that. But the mixture of him spilling the ink and it being, like, covering his throat as well just gives that effect that um, mm-hmm. she, she really took him out <laughs> and it's yeah. actually pretty violent, surprisingly, uh, at least the aftermath. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's, it's very, uh, very cool. Yeah. Yeah. And I think uh, maybe pivoting towards reductive rating round, this one gets a very, very solid four um, from, from me. I think that, uh, yeah, it's just, I, I like how sort of like bitter and kind of nihilistic. And I do like that. Uh, I think you use the word Steve at, at the beginning. It, it does have a kind of like fable like quality to the way that it's trying to leave this just allegorical enough and sort of broad enough that, yeah, it could be anyone. It could be anywhere. This could, you know, this is just a, a palpable, uh, you know, sort of misanthropic situation that could bubble up in in any kind of community and i i do um you know think it's very interesting that obviously you know when this originally came out in the nazi occupation of france it was you know largely depicted or you know seen as a depiction of a corrupt and evil french people uh and now many many years later people are like well obviously this is just a, this is an anti-informant allegory and yeah. cluzo has just a really exceptional feel for how to and and I, I don't think that people were necessarily wrong on their original interpretation. I think they were just wrong at exactly what he was pointing at. But I think they were reading into the right things. Like the atmosphere feels that way. Mm-hmm. It feels like it has a, a, a sort of a distrust of of people uh, in in a similar way that some of these characters do. And he uses every visual tool that he can to highlight that, like the lighting and the framing and the the architecture of it, like just the, how poisoned and paranoid these characters become and how insular they become and and cruel to one another um and you know they and and hypocritical is uh yeah yeah it's just it's it's the kind of thing that you could imagine happening to real people who were experiencing a very violent force that was surveilling them and and threatening them and yeah you could imagine even at the time uh people didn't want to hear about their friends betraying them which is something yeah. that was happening and we knew about happening. Uh, and yeah, I think, I think it was, it's a, it's a pretty brave thing to kind of put out there. Uh, and you know, the fact that he was also able to put in some stuff about the anti anonymous letters and stuff in there, which the Nazis, I don't know how they let him release it. Cause they would have, <laughs> you know, like that, that's just very overtly something that they, you know, was against what they were doing. They, they loved having people rat on their neighbors to them. Um, <laughs> But I, but yeah, overall, I think it's it's really, really well shot, very beautiful, and the the atmosphere of it of uh, just distrust and 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 cruelty and the way that it feels, you know, less interested in the exact who or why than just kind of the festering nastiness 
um, of uh, what takes control of these people. And uh, uh, yeah, so very, very solid four for me. And if I was working on my type five, um, I would say, can you believe that they called this thing the Raven? They should just do a remake and call it Twitter. And, <laughs> 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 um, well, it's all birds, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, that's it for me. Peace out. Have a good night, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Drop some Tip your waitresses. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm going to give it a four as well. I think this is, this is great. I just, I love how it's so dark and cold and paranoid. Um, and just, you know, watching these, these characters constantly make judgments on every other character and then finding out what's really going on in their lives. But yet they're still like, no, it's not me. It's you. Um, it's just always fascinating. And it just, uh, it's, it's, it is of course sad to watch a community destroy itself, but um, it's interesting to watch at the same time. So, uh, yeah, I, I think it's a beautiful film and I love the, like what we've already talked about, uh, little sequences, like the funeral sequence is unreal. A lot of great camera techniques and that leads into this kind of like chase that isn't necessarily even a conventional chase, just a, a paranoid woman running away from the community. That's that you're not even seeing chase her really. It's just that she's found later. And I think that it just accents the kind of paranoid feeling that you get with this film. Um, and then, you know, kind of the, the big shadows that they use in certain ominous shots. And, uh, uh, I like that they made, uh, Vorzette just the most like charismatic laughing, likable guy. And he's the guy that's in the, in the background, destroying this entire community. Um, so yeah, I think, I think this is really good. So solid four. For you, Steve. Uh, yeah, I, um, I'm I'm probably gonna go the full five. Nice. Um, Hell yeah. Just on on my most recent uh, viewing, it's it just it, it's it's just so beautifully made and just so forceful and and mm-hmm. just incredibly cynical. But <laughs> you know you can certainly understand why, and it it's aged incredibly well. Oh yeah. Just yeah. the just the the just the idea of you know people being able to weaponize their own their own innate suspicions against each other it's yeah that's um that that, that still feels kind of relevant so <laughs> definitely and you know it, it it's I mean Clouseau was a genius and it's a great film so I, I'm going with the five nice oh, yeah, yeah this is my I first uh... Clouseau I got to watch more of him oh he's yeah he's brilliant he's 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 wonderful. Yeah, I can't wait to uh, do some more. We'll definitely be doing more uh, coming uh, this year. I think I think uh, someone wanted to pair one of his movies with uh, La True. Is that is that what that one's called? The the Prison Escape one. Okay. Oh yeah yeah yeah. Oh the, oh. the Jacques Jacques Becker. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so, I've been meaning to get to that one. Yeah, that looks cool too. Um, but yeah, I think that will uh, wrap it up for Le Corbeau. Uh, We are going to be right back, and we are going to be talking about Address Unknown. Stick around. Right, we are back and we are talking Address Unknown, the 1944 American film noir war drama directed by William Cameron Menzies and based on the 1938 novel of the same name by Chrisman Taylor. Uh, this is going to be our first time talking about William Cameron, uh, Cameron Menzies as well, who uh, I am looking briefly at uh, – his career seemed to be uh, known for his uh, legendary art direction and production design and for being a silent era special effects artist. Yeah. He more or less invented the whole idea of production design. So, which is, yeah, that's crazy. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. He, he, he worked on Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, the thief of Baghdad. It's a wonderful life and is probably most famous uh, for 
Gone with the Wind. Some of you might have heard of this film. Uh, he did where he he did uh, some of the most lavish and colorful set design and decoration of his career. And his work on that film was so integral to the way that it looked um, that that is why they coined the term production design. And he received an honorary Oscar for his work on that film under the term production designer. <laughs> which is why his career is split up into art direction and production design. Cause they weren't sure what to call that title at a certain point. Like they were like, I don't know. So you have to look under both titles to find all the work that he did, but he also had a knack for, you know, not just sets and stuff, he like special effects and stuff as well. He gravitated towards doing a lot of, uh, science fiction. It looks like in, in his career, he directed HG, the adaptation of HG Wells as things to come. He also did the fifties invaders from Mars, which we referenced briefly when we did our Toby Hooper invaders from Mars episode. Um, but between directing those films, he experimented briefly in the 1940s with, uh, with noir, which is what we're going to be talking about today. And what a, a piece of material to experiment with on like the one time you were going to like, maybe take your stab at it. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, well, it, the novel was written by a woman named Catherine Taylor in 1938, and it was seen as incredibly controversial in terms of I guess that's the pairing too controversial uh, pieces of art uh, in the times that they were made because the subject matter was basically deemed too aggressive to be published under the name of a woman, so they <laughs> made her use her middle name Cressman uh, as her first name, so Cressman Taylor. I love that, Taylor, and I love it that would, bit. <laughs> yeah. Like and, and that would go on to become her her uh, pen name for the the rest of her career essentially and this and it would go on to be a pretty I'll say a pretty prophetic piece of art that would uh, diagnose <laughs> Nazi hysteria many years before it uh, you know officially broke out and actually became you know what we now know it as like 1938. You know, yeah. she was saying they're going to be starting hounding people in the streets and, you know, like the kinds of things that we're seeing in here. Like by the time they were making it in 1944, they, you know, they were probably like, well, we're dealing with some some actual ground reports at this point. But yeah, not when she she wrote the novel, um, which was uh, apparently based on like a small news article she saw where American students in Germany um, were uh, writing home about the uh, truth about, you know, some of the things that they were seeing Nazis uh Nazis do. Uh, and, and, um, uh, if, if I can just cut in here, yeah, I would, go. I'd just like to say, if you haven't seen Address Unknown, oh, yes, go watch it before you listen to this this talk. Oh, yes, yeah. because it's best experienced as cold as possible. Yeah. Yes, this, it's, would, this like, would be true. The opening, just it being so bright and happy, it seems almost <laughs> in a sense like that you're you're seeing two friends that seem to have a deep connection their their families are connected in a way where the um their uh their their son and daughter uh of each family are in love with each other um there's just you know there there's there's deep connection and relationships here that that you just watch slowly be destroyed because of uh you know a little bit like we were talking about with Le Cor Corbeau uh paranoia um but also because of just beliefs that kind of come with the the new rise of of nazi of nazism so it's it's um it gets really dark as it goes but i it presents itself almost like a like a happier drama at first oh yeah the yeah the the open the opening bit in the uh the garden of um uh martin schultz's uh house where they're 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 all there to celebrate what they think is going to be a marriage announcement mm -hmm. and it, it, and then it turns out it's like, well, Schultz is going back to Germany. He's supposed to take uh, uh, his business partner, uh, Max Eisenstein's daughter with him because she wants to be an actress. Uh, but Martin's son, his eldest son, is in love with her, with uh, with uh, Griselda, his uh, Max's daughter. And they're going to get married, except that they're not because Griselda really wants to be an actress. Yeah. Yes. So they're kind well, of and I, like, I like to that we're introduced to them. Um, drinking wine and like saluting and there's this giant painting because they're, they're living in San Francisco and you think briefly that we're watching like what is them like pr up against like a cityscape and I was like wow this guy's known for his production design that's like very obviously like a painted background and then it's revealed to be a giant painting and they are art dealers and like that's yep. their deal and like it's, it's a very very uh, cool little visual touch there <laughs> <laughs> definitely 
Uh, and yeah, Max is planning on heading back to Germany to continue their art dealing from there. Like he's going to start collecting pieces and sending them back to him. And there is a little bit of concern about, with him and his kids as he's like, you know, how how American we've become. We haven't lived in like the homeland for many, many years. And, uh, you know, Max brushes him off, actually. He's like, well, you know, there's no more of that Prussian arrogance going on <laughs> in Germany anymore. There's no more of that militarism. They're practically <laughs> like American now. There's just they just don't have baseball. That's it. That's the only thing, you know. <laughs> and uh, and then when they get there, there's that whole that whole business about how his kids can't can't properly pronounce German, and the, the yes. you know the how that the housekeeper is trying to trying to get him to to properly say that a letter has arrived from Max from San Francisco, and yes. he's and he gets too excited and he's just like, oh, what letters have come from San Francisco? It's from Uncle Max. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, when uh, when Martin makes his way uh, to Germany with his with his family there, he is uh, introduced to a character by the name of Baron von Freisch, uh, who is a, a character who is just kind of like seen creeping outside their property um, and uh, during a storm. And he mm-hmm. finds out that he belongs to one of the oldest and richest families in Germany. Uh, and I do like the way that very frequently throughout the entire film, uh, this dude is just uh, framed like silhouetted or in shadows before making an entrance to a scene. Like he's, he feels like he's constantly like popping out of the underworld or something like that to yeah, like even his, say hello. Even his introduction <laughs> when like you were mentioning he's out in the storm, it's just them looking through a window. He's holding a dog. The storm is massive and he's just kind of staring up at their house. Like it just feels so ominous, and it, it, it he does feel like a character that's coming in to uh, corrupt them and 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 make things just horrible for them. Yeah, I mean he's dressed all in black, and he's standing in the middle of the storm, and they're like, "Well, let's invite him in." You know, I mean, <laughs> metaphorically, it doesn't get much more blunt than that, does it? <laughs> yeah, no. it'll be fine. <laughs> no. Yeah, well, and, and also literally disrupting the communication process where, like, the two families are keeping in touch via letters across the pond. And there's parts where he's like, you know, he's uh, reading his letters out loud and being like, you know, I'm not sure about this Adolf Hitler fella, you know, <laughs> and I don't know about him. Uh, and uh, he, you know, this is the Baron comes in and uh, listens to that. And he's just like, so your friend's not sure about that uh, Adolf Hitler fella, huh? Well, let me tell you about him. He's uh mm. he's great and uh <laughs> he has big plans for Germany. And uh you know, uh Germany has found its destiny and uh the future sweeps us towards an overwhelming wave and you know, we've got to move with it. History uh writes uh writes a clean clean no page. And you know, just like really you know, like very obvious what, what was kind of funny to me about this. I don't know how you guys felt about it. Um it's it seemed like the most obviously propaganda like the way that he was speaking to him i was actually mm-hmm. a little concerned at how quickly he was converted to nazism off like just like the the easiest pitch anyone could have possibly i was i was a, a little unsure how martin was so obviously attracted to it uh right off the start because it just oh. it happens so quickly and i guess cuz the movie's also like 70 minutes so they they need to oh. have him do this quickly. It's partly that, and it's also partly that it's, you know, 1944. This is clearly meant as agitprop. Right. You know, ag- ag- again, uh, you know, against Nazism. But, right. You know, it also, yeah, it's, uh, you know, it, it's making its point quickly and forcefully because it's got shit to do. Yeah. yeah I also read absolutely. it as almost him also being forced into the belief a little bit until he legitimately does believe it at least for a certain time but it like his letters i think at the beginning as he starts to turn are kind of like we just need to go with this wave um you know it's it's i feel like it's the answer for germany uh i i wouldn't worry about anything you know totally awful happening i mean i'm paraphrasing of course he says it more eloquently but he's essentially telling um max back home that you know there's there's not Nothing too much to worry about, but things are changing and he might have to go with that, that, that wave. Yeah. Uh, Over top and, and of montages feels, of shops being destroyed and like people marching in the streets and them right. talking about like floggings. Yeah. And so clearly whatever oh, yeah, that, he's telling that, him, he's only yeah. telling him half the truth, really. Yeah. The, 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 that, that, that cut from, cut for him, you know, like dictate, like, you know, writing the letter 
uh, where you can hear the, 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 the voiceover to the inside shot uh, of the shop, which has the J painted on it. And then a dude just smashes the window in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then it cuts to the outside where you can see there's st- the people who own the shop are still in it. Yeah. Just watching all the chaos. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's also interesting to, to note that uh, in his early letters, he's, I think you're correct in that he's, he, he's not quite convinced yet, but he knows what he needs to say. So he's parroting uh, like the official rhetoric that's been handed to him. Uh, like he, he has a couple, couple phrases that, that uh, the Baron says to him that later pop up in his letters, like, um, you know, shrugging off like a forgotten coat or, mm. you know, he mentions the overwhelming wave, you know, the, you know, these are, these are things that, that have been taught to him that he's like, well, I guess I'm going with this because you know, I, I want to be successful. Yeah. And, and even when I he guess makes, this is how you be successful in society. Yeah. And even when he makes the more disgusting decisions that he makes later on, which I won't get into details yet, it still feels like, even though it's completely fucking cowardice and just horrifying, <laughs> and terrible, that it is yeah. out of, uh, at least a, a bit of it is out of fear rather than this like full on, I believe what's happening in my country is is a good thing but it, it, he's just kind of towing the line and going along with it which is just as bad and evil <laughs> but yeah. uh it, it does show i think that it's just this this kind of pressure that this that this type of politic can bring um can corrupt even people that might not you know necessarily even believe in it they just they they have to go along with it, and I'm not you know once again I'm not saying well, it's any you, less guilty, but there's there's yeah, something there where yeah it's there's like the, there's fear. very clearly a depiction of like the economic force of it, and yes. that it's kind of like right. you know you you know you he he is made rich, he is brought into the official Nazi party, he has mm-hmm. found success for his family, for him and his wife, and yep. you know there there's a there is meant to be something I think attractive there to it. For me personally, yeah. I did wish we get a little bit more of that. But I mean, yeah. I understand also it's 70 minutes, but so I was sitting there going like, this is as lean and powerful as it is for a reason. But there was part of me that I was like, and this is not a, a particularly fair comparison either. But I was thinking back a little bit to when we were what, when we covered uh, the cremator. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And, and I was thinking of a, of a movie, talk about a movie that sort of so displays the sort of conversion and attraction quality to you know, and show and 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 Steve's point is also taken too that you know, Cremator came out many, many, many years later. Address this is coming out in the thick of it. This is meant to just be. Right. This is bad. Don't you know? The people get swept up in this. Don't do this. Yeah, exactly. So I understand why they maybe don't want to show the psychological instincts that would lead people to, you know, maybe be subjectively attracted to or moved into. And, you know, so so I was sitting there going like, I I totally understand why this exists in the way that it does. But in the context of watching it many, many, many years later, I was sitting there going, it's it is it is surprisingly easy the way that he is moved from being a guy whose best friend is a Jew and he wants his he wants to have a Jewish daughter in law to being a guy who's like, you know, I can't you know, be with you anymore. And I just, I didn't even, it didn't feel like he was given an, that much of a reward. I just maybe even wanted a couple more scenes to see what his life looked like. Cause there are the few that we do get, I think are really good. Like there's an amazing scene. I thought when Max's neighbor goes all the way to Germany to deliver his, his letter by hand so that the Nazis oh, can't yes. sit through his letter. Right. And there's this, and I wanted more of this kind of stuff, but there's this part where He's like, I'm a guy from San Francisco. And if you tell him to come out and see me, he'll come out and fucking see me. So and and he does. And he comes in and he welcomes him into his office. But when he's welcome into his office, Martin's office is just like in comparison to being surrounded by art and plants and the way that they were at the beginning of the film. It's just this bare, imposing, like symmetrical frame of him standing in the very center and the walls just looking like a big like cage almost. And it's just it's it's. Yeah, it's, it's like he and has this. The way, like the way I saw it was the he has all this open space before you get to his desk, and it's just like an intimidation thing. It's like a tactic yeah. almost. It's like they have to walk all the way to you before you sit down and deliver or talk or whatever you're supposed to be doing. And he has such a a stern uh, face when he's doing this. Like his emotions are pretty much that th- there's nothing surfacing whatsoever. And before he's very much a. You know, he's a bright and colorful man that that seems to enjoy drinking with his friends and laughing and and having a good time with his family. 
And that that's that first image you get where he's just made a complete 180 change. Um, he never lowers his, his chin that entire shot. Yeah. And what it, I do like, in, it, I, I find it interesting, though, that when he does open the letter, when the guy leaves and he calls him like cold or something like that, when he opens it, he does have kind of like an excitement to him a little bit. He opens it very quickly. And it's almost like he's he's waiting for the next uh, piece of information, even though he knows it's far too late and he's going to have to answer Max the way he does, which is, I think, when he decides to tell him, like, we can no longer talk. We're no longer friends. Uh, you're against my the, the, the party that I'm a part of now and you're an enemy, essentially. Yeah. And, and the, there there is a level where you 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 can accept that he's writing because he knows that, that the censors are reading his, mm -hmm. uh, his words. Yeah. You as but an audience that, member almost want to keep hoping that that's what it yeah. is, you know, but it's like, like the, the, the interlude with the, uh, the neighbor from San Francisco, that was his out. That, that was his out. Yeah. That was, that, that was his, you know, that his opportunity to get a message out to be like, I'm I'm just writing the way I'm writing because I know that they're reading my mail. Yeah, and, and now he now now he doesn't have that. Yeah, instead he just decides to to fulfill his role as a functionary, which which is one of the myriad reasons why I love this film because it's like sometimes fascism doesn't look like jackboots. Sometimes it just looks like a cog in a machine. Mm -hmm. And it's so sad to watch Max react to these things because he's even saying himself, like, I can't possibly believe this, that like it has to be the censors that he's doing this because yeah, he's my can't. best friend and business partner. And we love art. And, yeah. you know, like we're both German. And he's like, this is like like we, you know, the literally the only thing that could possibly be fueling this is just, you know, like a like a, a hatred of my of my Jewishness, which he eventually says, is you know, as a result, he can't correspond with him or be friends with him anymore. Even uh, Martin's own son reads that letter and is like disgusted. Like, what the, f what is f happening? Like, this is not him. Yeah. This doesn't make any sense. And yeah. yeah, he, he does eventually just go along with it because it makes financial sense too, which then rubs up against, obviously he traveled to Germany with Grisel mm -hmm. going, yeah. who's going to set up going, her who's... position to kind of get her into these like auditions and stuff like that. It seems at least. Yeah, um, to get her some some acting in in Berlin and going by not her last name Eisenstein, but going by the last name uh, Stone, which starts to she starts to feel the pressure because she's trying to finally get her big break in acting, and she's having the Nazis censor her big performance, which she's not liking. Which is this great fucking scene of the oh, Nazi yeah. advisor when 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 he that long shot down the entire like uh, sort of like auditorium. Shadow. With the with the little like blinding ray of light coming through the little door, and you see his little silhouette just walk all the way down, and you get the whole shot of him like walking all the way down until his and he face comes down is just right there. Yeah, and he, and he's like, the following lines in your play are not acceptable, and any <laughs> disobedience is treason. And he and literally he just starts quoting. This is this is once again kind of stuff that it's it's pretty on the nose. He's literally saying just like quotes from the Bible. Like yeah. just generally well accepted, normal, like be good to one another. Yeah. And it's, <laughs> He's it's like, anything that promotes like wrong. The, the innocent uh, <laughs> yes. or, or the meek or the weak taking over and, and kind of finding yes. strength. So anything like that. So that no. That's that, that that's one of the canniest things about the film is yep. that that's there. He's specifically censoring lines from the Sermon on the Mount. Yes, which mm. is the bedrock basis of Christianity. Yeah, so he's conflating an attack on Judaism with an attack on Christianity. Yeah, mm. so it's yeah. you know it's like well yeah if you know what harms one harms all. Yeah, yeah. well, and and she's just in shock. She's like, can this can this can that little man do this? And he's, oh, I love that the, line. The, the director is like, yes, I'm I'm afraid that he can. And I love also <laughs> the the giant arch of their set and. The, again, the, the 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 they repeat the long shot as the Nazi, the Nazi walks down the aisle and out again. In the and then there's like, then finally there's the actual stage show itself, which is this, this big wide shot where you know you get like the the, the huge uh, sort of like structures and all of the beautiful costuming that they're doing. And Grizel, in an act of sort of uh, pointed resistance, mm -hmm. she speaks the lines during the play. 
anyway and starts infuriating him and he starts calling for a stop to the show and you know starts trying to incite the the audience kind of uh, against her and she gets up there and says i do not believe that your government or any government wants to censor the word of god or goodness (laughs) and he responds by informing the entire crowd of her jewish last name which then starts an entire insane nasty riot with this incredible shot of them like breaking through the Curtain. barriers and the curtains on the way to get to her in the stage work. Amazing. Oh, yeah. Lordy, it's almost something yeah. you'd see out of like a zombie film or something like, yeah, they, it's nuts. They, they take all their little pocket knives and then like, you just see a full curtain and then it slices down like the middle of them. And then people just start piling into it and they're all just, you know, out for blood. And it's just absolutely fucking terrifying. Um, yeah. and even prior to that, I like that. Uh, well, I don't like it, but I, uh, it's, it's like, um, it, it's powerful that, that they say that. something like he says, like, we don't need reasons. Like you just censor what we tell you, your government has told you to do so it's treason yeah. and that's it. It's just very black and white. They don't even, there's no room for negotiation whatsoever. Um, but yeah, that, that chase sequence is, is horrifying. And then it leads into some really cool things where they have like, She's been running away for maybe a couple hours or something like that. And so she's going into these like really dirty fields and they have this amazing like tracking shot on the feet that's very stabilized and just kind of moving along as she's running into the mud and um, trying to get to some type of safety. And then it cuts away to the uh, the soldiers that are that are following her and they do the exact same um, foot shot but now it's like a group of men that are like a little bit more organized chasing her and it's just yeah. um it's really it's really amazing looking and a really horrifying sequence yeah this section of the movie is where the it really kicked into gear for me like like after when when she starts being chased out of the play and into the alley where mm. it's like it comes incredibly shadowy like the entire you know, like the 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 walls themselves are going to like swallow her. The, she she has the J painted on her door and she starts heading towards the countryside to try and get to uh, Martin's place. And yeah, the, the sequence you're talking about, I love the um, the way that they the angled way that they use like the the trees and the grass. They almost look like they're reaching up at her like claw like I was reminded of the scene that we talked about when we talked about Texas Chainsaw Massacre when she's literally running through the trees area and it's like the trees are reaching out and like cutting her almost like that's almost what it looks like. Oh, yeah. And there's this part too where like the the really harsh looking rocks and stuff like that that she's trying to like step across mm-hmm. and it, it eventually leads to her arriving at Martin's house for help. And she's, you know, she's she's begging to get let inside. She she the 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 door frame has been opened by Martin. He's like, I can't I can't let you in. There's this amazing um, shot where she's standing in the doorway. We can start to see the flash lines on the fence line behind her coming for her. And she's left a bloody handprint on the door frame while she's standing there. And he just closes the door on her and locks her out. And all we just hear is her being gunned down and the screams of it. And it's just really, really bleak. Yeah. Uh, and stuff. you see and the bloody the handprint biggest, like, that shock she left. Of movie. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, I mean, that bloody handprint is the most important thing in the film. Mm-hmm. Uh, because, I mean, obviously in Exodus, you know, the blood of the lamb painted on the doors of the of the uh, the Jews was like, you can pass over my house. Yeah. OK. Yeah. And then here it's like. The blood of a Jew on this guy's doorframe is like you passed over her. Now the Nazi machine will not pass over you as punishment. And this is when so, Elsa, yeah. his wife, really discovers the man that he's become because <laughs> this is <laughs> this was a hell of a decision that Martin makes here. Yeah, he's like you. That was going to be your daughter-in-law. Yeah. Like, what are you like? like what are weeks you doing? <laughs> like, yeah, you loved her. Why? Yeah, yeah. And the, I think the last thing he says to her before is, "You'll destroy us all." So it's yeah. it's it's like um, it really is that just kind of that selfishness and uh, cowardice, I guess. Uh, and he's, well, and he's, the, it's so craven. Yeah, and the fucking letter that he sends, I actually thought it was so insanely bad of a letter. I actually kind of chuckled a little bit because he's like, the letter is, is literally 
Max opens it up and he's like, dear Max, Heil Hitler, bad news for you. Your daughter is dead. (laughs) (laughs) And and it it seems so perfect that later he tries to smuggle a letter out with his wife who's who's leaving for Switzerland. And it's like, nope, sorry, too late for you, buddy. Like, it's like, no, these are my actual true feelings on it. It's like, no, it doesn't matter at this point anymore. You're doomed. Yep. I just, I just thought that was so funny because the, the 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 shock itself of her being murdered is so like viscerally shot and the way that it's just handled is I it's it's very very impactful and just to see Max get delivered the same news in just such like a like a blunt matter of fact like yep nope that's it you got you got the uh, j- just just the straight up facts and also Heil Hitler <laughs> yeah yeah. Um, it might it might as well be a we regret to inform telegram, you know? Yes. <laughs> yeah. And that that coldness and that bluntness is definitely what sets off uh, Heinrich, um, which will kind of get to the more specifics. <laughs> in, in yeah. Just I mean, pretty this much was now. my favorite section of the film. This was my favorite. Like, set, 100 percent like this. This oh. stuff is the the, the best because, so, yeah. again, he the has first made- half of the film. The first half of the film is the setup. The yes. second half is the delicious payoff. Yeah. He yeah. becomes like haunted essentially by these, yes. by these coded letters. <laughs> yeah. It's, it, it's amazing because he's, he's obviously, he's made this in, incredibly cold and selfish decision uh, to yeah. uh, let this girl be murdered. Uh, this girl that he previously loved that his son uh, was in love with. And, you know, he, it was like the, the, the final sort of uh, straw for, you know, you know, they were making all kinds of excuses. Oh, he's just going along with it because, you know, he, it, it makes sense too. he's just putting on a show in the letters. He's not actually but he's finally made a decision that shows which side he's on. Yeah, the state um, is more important than my daughter in law. Yeah. And so Max, uh, it's or at least it's seemingly Max is starting to send him coded messages in the mail. And at first, you know, we're kind of like, well, what, not exactly sure what he's trying to say, but he's getting these messages and he starts getting them against his will. And the you Nazis and I start, will understand. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. and, and the Nazis become very suspicious of him um, for this reason, because they're like, what could his Jewish friend be sending him all these code messages? And he starts looking at the mail and realizing that the Nazis are opening it before it gets to him and that it has been censored and they're, and they are reading his mail. And he, you, you really, uh, you know, there's also this really excellent shot, uh, of, uh, him hearing his mail arrive, uh, arrive at the front gate while like word worriedly sitting inside, knowing that he's about to receive another piece of mail. That's been, you know, part, uh, that's the party has sifted through to censor. Mm-hmm. And we slowly kind of begin to discover that this mail is kind of being intentionally set to him to make him look bad, to make him look yeah. like he's a conspirator or make him look like he's treasonous. But it's so convincing to the party that he just starts to almost kind of like that, that paranoia from Lurk look Corbeau starts sinking in where he's basically like it, it functionally doesn't matter. Like I look like I'm treasonous. They're going to come for me. And like, that's all that this is. And his entire house just become, he becomes afraid of the shadows on the walls. He thinks the Gestapo is around every fucking corner. The imagery of, you know, the, him just being looked like he is trapped in this like hell world, almost just be, you know, constantly being threatened by shadows everywhere. It's really amazingly done. I really also like the, um, the, the part where it's almost like his privilege that he's been given based on, you know, uh, going along with the state and, and the rise of, of the Nazis. Um, like he has a very big house and he has servants and all of that. And at one point, one of the servants actually brings in the letter when he's talking to the German guy. Uh, and that's what gets him in shit because he, you know, gives it to him. Uh, and then he's presented with it. He sees it and he notices that, you know, there's another coded letter and he's like, you know, that that's considered treason here. Um, and then he even yells at the servant. And I just think that there was something interesting about how it's like if he didn't have this incredibly luxurious lifestyle and didn't have a butler, he probably could have kept it under wraps a little bit <laughs> easier from the from the German guy. But, um, you know, it's it's almost like a, a richness that they've given him kind of uh fucked him over a little bit in that moment i uh yeah i mean there's a in the second half of the film there's just so many shots of of martin looking 
absolutely paranoid in his house, which has become a prison. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. You know, yeah. His, his gates, which, you know, his bar, his barred gates have now kind of become his own, you know, it, they're, they're keeping him in instead of keeping intruders out. And then there, uh, there's that great shot of him pacing in front of the bay window with, you know, where, uh, um, and Menzies and uh, whoever was uh, shooting the cinematography on this, you know, have the deep focus where he's just pacing paranoid. And then you see the, the mailman in the way in the background through the window, just delivering something. And it's like, Oh, another letter. Yeah. And, ah. Wow. Do you guys want to know who this was shot by, by the way? Who's that? Uh, Rudolph Matty. Uh, Passion of Joan of Arc, vampire lady from Holy Shanghai. Shit. <laughs> so he's one of my favorite cinematographers of all time. Okay, cool. Yeah, yep, to be or not to be. That's a baller right there, Rudolph. I mean, good lord. I they're, they're, I I wrote a top twenty several years back, and there were two directors in my top twenty, twice, and <laughs> Romero was one of them. Uh, Night of the Living Dead and Dawn of the Dead, and much to the surprise of everybody who assumes they know my taste, Dreyer was the other. Hell yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Passion of Joan of Arc and Vampire. Both of those are absolutely formative for me. Yeah, those Passion are, of Joan of Arc is is uh, incredible, <sighs> like total just, masterpiece. Yeah, the, the 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 greatest silent film ever made. It's it's oh wow, yeah, I love it too. <laughs> I think it's a total masterpiece, one hundred percent. Yeah, well, it's, that ex- that explains the imagery in this uh, second half of this one. Yes, that, ma- is- that makes so much more sense. I I hadn't looked that up before, and so yeah, that uh, that that absolutely explains so much of it for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, and I and I really like just how subjective it gets into his his fears and his paranoias and how yeah how as Steve was saying how how trapped he feels and how yeah this thing that was once a symbol of you know how much uh wealth and power he held was just instantly stripped away from him based on you know like what he knows to be like you know he's straight up telling them like he's he's sending you these coded messages intentionally to try and get you to disbelieve me but they are also paranoid at this point as well so this yeah. is where you get the mix into the look corbeau like everyone is experiencing a level of paranoia that's yeah. infiltrating their decision making to the point where i think it's actually even more hysterically expressed here where you just get a scene of him firing a gun into his kitchen table <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> And then running out his front gates and being trapped uh, in the frame by his own fence bars and being locked out of his own front door and presumably shot to death the exact same way that uh, Grizel was, which uh, this this part reminded me a little bit actually – of the ending from the the spy who came in from the cold was something I thought a little bit a little bit uh, yeah. with the, when they start to just surround him out there. Well, it's, it, I think it's extraordinarily important that he dies outside of his house because his house is his sanctum. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So they have to yeah, draw and lock out at the same him. door that she was shot. Yeah. In, in front and, of two. And yes, exactly. It's like he dies in the same place Grissel did, but also I, I I do think it's interesting that in his. In, in the front room, the 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 tile on the floor is checkered. Yes. So it's a chess match. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he's a pawn. Mm-hmm. He does he doesn't know his place. He just knows he has to advance somehow. And now he knows he can't. Yeah. yeah. So all this all, all this left for him is to be taken. Yeah. And I like that they don't um I mean I think it's I think it's pretty heavily implies that he's he's actually taken out or at least brought into a prison of some kind but i like that they don't show the the soldiers or anything like that it's almost it gives this sense of his own paranoia or sense of being haunted has taken over completely um Mm. and uh because i think all we see is you know we hear the soldiers approach the house then he runs back and then we just see the spotlight and then his like incredibly frightened face and then it it cuts away um, yeah. and I do think that he gets captured, but I also think it has this imagery of like this implication of, of just his paranoia taking over. See, I wasn't sure. I, I thought they totally could have killed him. 
Oh, well, yeah, they, I absolutely definitely. Think they, I would I think, believe that, too. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I think they shot the shit out of him. Yeah, yeah. I think I think that would have gone down, for sure. Well, j- 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 just because of visual implication, just because, like, we previously saw that scene from the other side of the door yeah, yeah. where they shot her down. So I was kind of going, I just kind of assumed that they were like, we don't need to show you this, but he went down the same way that Grizel went yeah. down. Yeah, uh, In absolutely. the exact same spot that she went down and everything. And then for you... Sure. Uh, then you get, uh, you know, one of Max's letters is returned to him because uh, I do like that, like in the, the universe of the movie, because he gets to look at the the, the address was unknown. So yeah. as a result, you got your letter sent back to you. And then he's like, well, I haven't sent a letter since, you know, before uh, Grizel died. And he, you know, suddenly realizes that someone has been sending Martin mail and he looks up at Heinrich and you just get this amazing shot of Heinrich's eyes. Also, you know, kind of his figure kind of behind bars. And then you but you just get this beam of light hitting his really, really intense eyes as yeah. we realize that Max has not been sending these letters. Heinrich has been sending these letters to his own father and essentially constructed a scenario in which he would suffer the same fate that, uh, you know, his uh, his uh, soon to be wife uh just uh experience and it is a it is a cute little uh twist and i i do like uh the the framing on on his face and also the reaction shot from max who is like wide-eyed and like oh my god yeah kind of <laughs> yeah, he's, almost, he's almost horrified like not the i think there's an understanding but there's also just like i can't believe this is where it's gone i can't believe it's become yeah. this um I, and even I'm, heinrich has this very like He's very, he's an, he's unhappy, of course, in this, in this, um, in this place that he's in now, but there's also a little bit of like satisfaction and, and pride that he tries to emote as well while he's kind of, um, showing Max that, yeah, this was me. So it's, it, it's so dark, like having, <laughs> having the son be the one to end up taking the vengeance and essentially killing his father. It's, uh, yeah. It's devastating I, um, stuff. I I, uh, I wrote a, re- a review of it a, a bit ago, and uh, I I summed it up as uh, you you never know what uh, who you never know who is going to be hurt by the actions you take, or what actions that hurt will inspire. So that's true. It's like, yeah, I'd say I mean, that that's it's you know that that last ten seconds is one of my favorite. Uh, reversals in uh in cinema i just i i just love how it uh how it drops that bomb in your lap and he's like oh yeah go ahead sit with that yeah this has been a revenge movie the whole time (laughs) (laughs) yeah yeah well uh maybe pivoting i think towards a reductive rating round on address unknown uh i i think i'm 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 kind of sitting on the fence here so i i think i'm gonna let some other people go first uh, Steve, yeah, you, Steve, you go, go first this time around. Pitch us. Um, after my most recent viewing uh, the other day, I am I was a four on it, but I'm swinging to the five. Nice. Just, Damn. Just because, I mean, I, I you know, after having seen it the, the first couple of times, I've been recommending it to anyone who will listen to me. <laughs> so I, I got to be honest with myself. This, this is absolutely... Uh, uh, just a top film for me at this point. So it, it's, oh. it's, 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 uh, it's so well built. It's so sneaky in what it's doing. It's just, you know, it, you don't often find the combination of agitprop and melodrama and noir just meshed together so devastatingly well. So yeah, I, yeah. I gotta give it the five. Yeah, I'm like I'm crossed between it's like a strong three to a solid four, honestly. Like I don't really know. I, I wish I I kinda wish I got to rewatch this one. Um because I like the I really did enjoy watching it transform into the dark film that it is. Uh like I was almost thinking that it was gonna turn into a more hopeful movie as it went along in some way, like Martin would find some some way to get through this and maybe it was what max thought which was you know that he was just doing it to to survive some a a survival tactic and you know the friendship would remain intact and all of that and then when it just becomes you know complete 
um, it's it, it's like paranoia and then eventually a vengeance story uh, and just a, a story also about like cowardice um, and and uh, I guess corruption of the mind a little bit like just based on state power because uh, it, it once again a lot of what Martin seems to his decision making mostly seems to be out of just fear a lot of the time um, and uh, I, f- I, f- I found that very interesting that even though I can understand him being scared and you know, trying to be subtle within his letters and all of that. But like, once it hits that that point with Grizel, there's just no turning back. And he's become, wh- whether or not it was out of fear or out of passion for his new, the new state, it doesn't really matter. It's the same result. And uh, it's it's the same violence being dished out and innocent people are dying. So it's uh, innocent people that he's supposed to love are dying. So it's... um. Yeah, there's a, like I don't know. I'm I'm kind of still kind of cross with it. I right now I'm I guess I, I usually tend to until I rewatch something uh, go with the lower rating just to be safe because um, I like to upgrade things rather than downgrade things. <laughs> so I, I I think right now I'll go with the strong three. But I I uh, I'm going to rewatch this and it's it's I mean as long as hard as the content is to watch, it's easy to watch in the sense that it's like you know, 70 minutes long. So this is something I'll be revisiting, I think. Um, Cause I just, I love what it, when it turns into the, like h- him just alone in the winter in his giant mansion, completely haunted by his decisions. Uh, every letter he gets just feels like it's um it, like if it was a haunted house, he'd be seeing a ghost in the corner, but instead he just <laughs> sees a silhouetted mailman giving him another coded letter that's going to lead to his death. I, I think all of that is, is, really fantastic um and i i do think it like we were saying earlier it's a little quick to um just just for i think as the audience to understand his mentality and how he's thinking the the switch from you know not going along with the 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 nazi regime to going along with it is rather quick um but that could also be saying that that's how powerful they were like it's it's a very fast thing and that could also overwhelm people maybe um, it's it's so yeah. very seductive, yeah. Yeah, so I have a, I, I have, I just want to, I, I want to retackle it again before I give it the, give it the solid four. But this is awesome, and I would highly recommend it. Yeah, I think, I think, uh, I think Steve's convinced me. I think I'm gonna sit around kind of like the, the, the lower four because I was in kind of the same boat. But I think I am gonna go with the four because my one qualm with this is the one that Jamie just mentioned that we mentioned a couple times. That is, I in the early goings, I found it honestly simple in terms of its drama in a way that was almost funny. Like just how just in the first half, just how obviously and openly it spells out this friendship to Nazi conversion story. Like it, it Mm. happens so easily and it's so obviously and and in, in a good way too, it's on the nose. And I think Steve's argument that it's, it's very clearly agitprop was, I think what kind of convinced me that that's, you know, like it's, it's obviously it is trying to be an instructional instructional piece of anti-Nazi art in the time when that mattered to be that right. Like when it really, yeah. really was like, you know, important that there wasn't any kind of complication to that. It's like, no, 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 no. This is, he, he converts and that's it. And part of me just goes, it's, looking at it through modern eyes is the version of me that's like oh come on i want to see how he got converted i want to see how he was attracted i want to i don't want it to just mechanically happen because that's what's happening i want to like i want to get into the psychological instincts of it and get into his headspace a little bit um and in 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 that regard i don't think it's a necessarily fair thing to uh ding the movie for and if anything it actually reminded me of uh another melodrama made around the same time that i really love called uh murderers are among us um which is uh i I would recommend to anyone who who liked this film because it also has a pretty i i think that one has a more interesting and unconventional sort of character melodrama baked into it where it has this very sort of guilt-ridden approach to the ease with which war criminals were welcomed into german post-war reconstruction process and also literally shot in the uh rubble of uh post-war berlin yeah uh, yeah. when it when it was made by a guy who was a you know nazi collaborator artist he was actually acted in nazi propaganda at one point so it's made from the perspective of someone who was like 
you know, intentionally guilt ridden over that and was wondering why so many of his friends who were literal Nazis were, you know, welcomed back into society after doing that. And so uh, in, in, in terms of like working through that kind of subject matter in the time that it was happening, you know, this is a really great example of of doing that. And for me, when it does make the switch from the play onward um, to the sort of more expressionist horror and Martin kind of becomes privy to, uh, you know, being surrounded by shadows and cages and, you know, this this paranoid paranoid fear that he has and the eventual switch into cold, blunt revenge movie treatment that it does by the very end. Like, I think the way that it makes that transition is is quite strong and and obviously yeah. very very visually um attractive in terms of the way that it, you know like lines on people's uh faces and on surfaces and the framing and like lots of focus on door frames and staircases and tiles as steve mentioned too with the the floor um just lots of attention paid to space and characters trapped in them and with a very very uh you know uh you know I, I would argue for its time, pretty fucking dark and shocking, uh, mm. you know, uh, uh, conviction to uh, yeah. both both not not just what it's trying to message, but like the bleakness that was coming um, as well. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I think that uh, this one this one kind of shocked me a little bit and uh, especially, too, because, again, in the early half, I was sitting there going, wow, this is even for melodrama. This is uh, pretty simple and on the nose. Um, mm-hmm, yeah. But but yeah, the the filmmaking, I think, totally won me over ultimately. So, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to stick with the kind of like the lower four on this one for now. But yeah, I like Steve. I I and Jamie, I, I both I I think I want to return to this one because I, I look yeah. like Steve, your journey with this also looking at your three watches here, you went from a three and a half to a four to a five. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to be on the same yeah, trajectory. Pretty much. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. And I, 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 I will say I, w- I will recommend anybody who's, who, who's interested in the film to see it as cold as possible, yeah. but it also plays like gangbusters on a repeat mm-hmm. because since you know, what's coming, it's like the earlier parts of the film are like, okay, they're setting up this, 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 and this. Yeah, just to knock this down kind of deal. Yeah, it starts, it starts to make more sense looking at it in that way. Yeah. yeah. And Very also, cool. as it, just as a, uh, a, a little throw-in, uh, my kid watched most of it with me this time. And she's nine. And, like, the, fr- the first part of the film, she's like, ah, boring, boring. <laughs> <laughs> and then by the end of the film, she's like, oh, I actually liked that. <laughs> yeah. So, so. There you go. Yeah. Hell yeah. yeah. Well, uh, cool, so. yeah, educate them well. That's awesome. Yeah, I wish I was watching that when I was nine. I don't, I don't think <laughs> yeah. I was. It definitely was um, not. Hey, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I'm just saying her, she got to see her first R rated film this year. What was it? Nope. Oh, say. Hey, that's a, that's good, a one. good one. She loved it. That's killer. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, and I, I I think it's greatly amusing that uh after after the film she went to a, a family party and it, it wasn't the uh the the violence or you know the anything like that that stuck out to her. It was the fact that everybody said motherfucker a whole bunch in the movie. <laughs> and she decided to tell everybody at the family party about that. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, it's very rock so. and roll. <laughs> it's like, yeah, okay. I know my kid's gonna have a dirty mouth. Okay, fine. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. All right. Well, I think that that is going to wrap it up for uh, this week. That was Look Corbeau from 1943 and Address Unknown from 1944. Thanks so much, Steve, for uh, bringing these uh, films with you and and yeah. and for joining us. Uh, yeah, no what's What's going on in uh, Steve World? You got anything to promote? Any any writing that you've been doing recently, or any projects you've been doing? A couple of things. Um, I mean, I have a Patreon now. Hell yeah! Um, sign up for it. Yeah, it's a uh, www patreon com slash l cosgrove, um, and it's it's uh, the it's basically me working through the enormous pile of discs that I own. So it's <laughs> sick. 
it's 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 very you know sort of navel gazing and everything but I, I I hope that the work I'm doing within it is interesting enough that, you know, it works for people who aren't me, basically. Do you uh, really have 4,882 discs? I, I own 4,882 films. Ah, um, some of them are on box sets, correct? Some of them are in box sets. Some of them are on, on you know, discs that have multiple films on them. Um, but yes, yeah, basically – uh, in a very realistic sense, yes, I do. <laughs> God damn! All right, well, good luck on that project, Jesus. I'm 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 fortunate that I make a, an okay living with my day job. So, <laughs> well, I have seen 808 movies in your collection, only 16. percent So not <laughs> not a, I got a I got a, those are some rookie numbers. I feel like whatever. You're halfway to where I am. You're fine. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I I've, I've paid for all these and I've only seen thirty three percent of them. So, God damn. Well, <laughs> yeah, definitely uh, head on over and and support Steve on on his uh, on his journey to get through his pile. I I know your uh, your feelings there when when the uh, original first few months of of COVID happened. I literally uh, sat down and was like, how many of these have I not seen? <laughs> and I just started watching them chronologically one after another. And I, I got my unseen pile from like three or 400 discs down to like 50 discs in the, in, over that period of time. So it was pretty, it was a, it was a, a fun experience. So yeah, good luck yeah. on that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, uh, <laughs> I, um, yeah. COVID. Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of, that was uh, a whole uh, other experience happen. for me. Yep. Uh, but for for our listeners, uh, we are going to be back in one week's time where we are going to be wrapping up Noir Vember with uh, noirs that take place in the vicinity of fixed boxing matches. And you might be like, are there two movies that are about that? And yes, oh, there, are. there are. There are the setup directed by Robert Wise, 1949, as well as the Brian De Palma film from 1998 starring Nicolas Cage snake eyes and they take two very very different stylistic approaches one is a more uh kind of humane uh look at the sort of uh brutal industry itself and the with a lot of sort of sad lived in detail and then you have snake eyes which is just the most bombastic possible version of a uh conspiracy assassination thriller um, but, uh, yeah, both have to do with the, the economic industry that, uh, surrounds boxing and, uh, characters trying to navigate it. So that's what we're going to be wrapping up to our November with. And then in two weeks time over on the main feed, we're going to be going back to regular scheduled programming. And, uh, we are going to be doing a double feature of the gate from 1987 and demon night, which I think it's from Heck 1992. Yeah. The, 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 no, Demon Knight's 96, I think. Oh, 96. Oh, 95 yeah. or 96. Might be 95 too. Yeah. The, yeah. Either way. Oh my we, God. I hope you guys have so much fun with that movie. It's great. Yeah. It's yeah I have never seen Demon Knight, so I am really excited for it, but I know that it's uh Ernest R Dickerson. So, yep. you know, one of the, the the legendary cinematographers shot do the right thing shot shot malcolm x shot a lot of spike lee stuff uh and uh yeah i think I, he also shot death by temptation right i think i bought yep, the vinegar he did shoot death by speaking temptation, of yep. speaking of uh, unwatched blu-ray piles that's one of mine death by temptation oh have you not seen that no but i bought it because every single person that i follow says it's sick so i was like okay it that's it's probably great a safe buy. it's really great <laughs> <laughs> awesome so yeah that's what we're we're going to be talking about uh in two weeks time over on the uh main feed so look forward to that but that awesome. being said i think that is going to wrap it up for everything this week thanks so much for listening and keep us easy keep us easy everybody